Board Gamers Anonymous, episode 64. This week's feature, Controversy in Tabletop Gaming. Our shout-out from the tabletop will talk about Dicetower.com. Our winner for the 2015 Tabletop Madness. Our at the table will be Machikoro Harbor Expansion. Our acquisition to sorter will be Burgle Brothers. And everything you want to know about Maelstrom 2015. Listening to a proud member of the Dice Tower Network, dedicated to bringing podcasters together for the greater good of gaming. It's sort of like Voltron, but with better lip syncing. Find out more at dicetowernetwork.com. Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast about board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Daniel. Welcome to the episode, everyone. We're so glad to have you join us here this week. We got an outstanding episode for you. Maybe a little controversial. Maybe a lot controversial. Daniel, this is going to be controversial, right? Well, you know, there, there are controversies, and then there are controversial controversies. And I think this might be one of the more controversial controversies about controvert. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, that was a controversial statement by Daniel. I told you this episode was going to be controversial. It's all over the place, man. Not to worry, even though it is a highly controversial episode, talking about highly controversial things, we won't have an explicit marker on this. So everyone can listen to our controversies about controversial things that are controversial. (laughs) (laughs) So this week we have some interesting stuff. We're going to take it to the tops of the table and let you know how... Our 2015 Board Gamers Anonymous Tabletop Madness finally came to an end. And we'll talk about what's hitting our table that, once again, is a controversial thing. And then for our feature review, just because you haven't had enough controversy so far, take you back to the BGA court. And we're going to talk about some controversial issues around tabletop gaming in actual tabletop games. And as gamers, what's our social responsibility to each other in our purchasing of games and our dealing with conventions? So we got a lot for you. So let's get started and let's get up there on the tabletop. Shout it from the tabletops. (laughs) Sir, you're going to need to get down from there. All right. So now that we're down from the tabletop, let's talk about everything dealing with gaming. The big piece of news for us has to be our inclusion in Dicetower.com's brand new website. So last year, Tom Vassell put together a Kickstarter campaign, and one of the things he wanted to do was to update the website. So as gamers, which you and I both are, we often like to get information about the brand new games, detailed information about how to play the games, and some strategy about these games. Now, one of the big sites for that has to be Board Game Geek. But really, if you go to Board Game Geek and you're looking at any videos, if you listen to any podcasts, they're going to be part of the Dice Tower Network. Tom Vassell does an outstanding job covering everything in gaming. So instead of going to Board Game Geek, come to the Dice Tower because you're going to find everything that you need there. And just from a basic search, and there's a little search games button up on the right side, you'll be able to type in your search, get a list of all the videos, all the reviewers, and all the podcasts that are talking about that particular game. So it's pretty much one-stop shopping as far as that concern. And you can also find Board Gamers Anonymous on there. Now, even though that's still there, we still have our BoardGamersAnonymous.com website. And since we're a weekly podcast, you're always going to find up-to-date information about board gaming there. So Go to the Dice Tower and then head over to Board Gamers Anonymous. And if this is the first episode you listen to from the Dice Tower Network, welcome. We're really glad to have you join us. And we produce each and every week. And we're big gamers just like you. And we're so glad to have you here join us. Yeah, I mean, as much as I love Board Game Geek, uh, the new Dice Tower site is just a heck of a lot easier to move around, a lot prettier. I mean, let's be honest, Board Game Geek kind of is formatted like a... uh, middle-sized industrial supply company (laughs) website from the mid-1990s or so. Uh, And it's kind of... It's really bad, you guys. It's really bad. They've got great information on there, but let's not pretend the website isn't (laughs) in dire need of a a rescan. But uh, the new Dice Tower side is really... Very nice, and that's a huge amount of content aggregated there, and it's uh, always very fresh. 
So, you know, come get your fresh board game podcast produce. <laughs> so while not a controversial issue, definitely an exciting one, and you should definitely check out Dicetower.com. We're going to take a break from our controversial topics and talk about something that we can all agree upon, gaming conventions. You may remember back in episode 59 where we talked about all the fun that we had at Dreamation 2015 in Morristown, New Jersey. This was a convention that was put on by Double Exposure. Well, now they're on to their next one. The 2015 Maelstrom Convention is happening April 10th through April 12th, 2015 in Morristown, New Jersey. Now, this convention eh, could be considered a little controversial because despite having one or two, you know, handful of different seminars and workshops, the schedule is yours. So come down to Maelstrom 2015, sit down and play anything you want. That's right, Open Gaming Convention. Now, it's not just Open Gaming but Maelstrom is bringing first-time and long-time master game teachers to play with you. So you can head over to an open table, find a game master, sit down, play, and learn a great new game. Make new friends and enjoy a great time. So previously we talked about Dreamation as if you were in the tri-state area, you should check it out. Now I'm going to up that a little bit. From Maelstrom 2015, if you're on the eastern seaboard, you should definitely be at this convention. Everyone at Board Gamers Anonymous will be there, and we hope to see you there. Go to www.dexposure.com for more information. Hey, Daniel, anything we've been doing that might be considered controversial? Huh? Huh? Maybe, maybe, maybe? Hmm... You know, I feel like uh, there was some sort of temporally bound lunacy, like um, it might be in a month of strangeness or something like that. But I feel as though something, (coughs) copyright loss, is preventing (laughs) me from expressing as clearly as I'd like. So maybe let's just call it tabletop madness. Exactly. So Board Gamers Anonymous had our 2015 Board Gamers tabletop madness competition legally distinct competition legally distinct bracketing system i don't know something that's legally distinct that we're not going to get sued for that's all we're worried about we don't know what it is (laughs) but we know we're not getting sued for it that's That's really what we're shooting for here don't sue us that is our new (laughs) motto board gamers anonymous please don't sue us (laughs) i thought that was on the family crest but it can be our motto we'll we'll work on it it's going to take up one of those areas so if you haven't listened to our previous episodes, I implore you to go back and listen to the episodes that led up to this final, final, final top winner out of all of the games. We actually picked out from the top 100 games from Board Game Geek the best games that we have played. We took submissions from listeners, piled them together in a bracket system in their ranked order. And then they battled out each and every week, or better to say, we battled it out each and every week and got really mad at each other and threw dice at each other. And there was a lot of dice throwing and a lot of dice rolling, so it was a fun competition to say the least. But now, here at the end, we're finally able to crown the winner of the 2015 Board Gamers Anonymous Tabletop Madness and uh, I'm going to leave it to Daniel because for some reason he had a win. Thank you, listeners. Now Spoiler I have to live with this. Alert. Spoiler I, alert. I Chris. had to listen. Now I have to listen to this for a whole year. <sighs> yeah. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I don't know who could have had the tremendous foresight to see where this was going. They'd have to be a titan amongst men. With a gaze that stretched to the very stars themselves because Race for the Galaxy lost miserably to Dead of Winter. <laughs> That's right. Uh, unlike, unlike my naysaying comrades here at uh, Board Gamers Anonymous, it appears that our listeners have in fact not had enough of the zombie theme and do not think that it's dead or spoiled except in the ways it's supposed to be (laughs) 
So Dead of Winter takes home the crown and is our winner for Tabletop Madness. Now, Dead of Winter in the semifinals uh, beat out Caverna, which yes. was a bit of an upset and surprised me happily. You're saying it was controversial then? Uh, one might say that. One might yes, say yes, that. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm sure at least one person will say that in the comments. We had uh, Mice and Mystics go up against Race, and Race beat out Mice and Mystics. People showing up for their sort of old reliable over something like the new hotness. But the hotness took the day with Dead of Winter beating everybody and taking the crown. Yes, congratulations to Jonathan Gilmore and Isaac Vega and everyone at Plot Hat Games for a well-fought and an outstanding game. Thank you all of the listeners out there who voted throughout the competition. I know it was a controversial win, but all right, it's a good win. And the listeners made the decision, and we're so glad that you did. You know, some of us Euro gamers here are a little sad to see the dwarves go down, but uh, I don't know. It's okay, I guess. And they could be zombie dwarves now. I guess so, and I guess they could race through the galaxy, right? <laughs> We're just gonna smash these games together. So the next game that should come out is clearly a Zor- zombie dwarven interstellar game. Done. Some- done. <laughs> done. Clearly. By Plat Hat know, Games. <laughs> by Plat Hat. It's not so surprising, right, that a game based upon surviving difficult odds and voting against, you know, opponents to eliminate them would win a voting-based elimination survival-ish bracket. You know, I don't know. That was a scratch. I don't know. I that mean, instead of winter, so some somebody out there was clearly the betrayer. I don't know. I think that's what <laughs> it comes down to. But uh, thank you all for voting again. It was an outstanding contest, a lot of fun. And, you know, listen to next year where Daniel will still be gloating over his win. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And if you didn't vote, you know, just remember, it's all your fault. <laughs> if you don't like what happened here, it's all your fault. You should have voted it, man. You should go down to BoardGamersAnonymous.com and, you know, participate. There you go. So, all right. So now that we wrapped up the endless legally distinct bracket competition for 2015 let's talk about what's hitting our table and now at the table with bga so this week what's hitting my table is the machi koro harbor expansion now we all got a chance to play machi koro previously daniel did you enjoyed that game right yeah i really had a lot of fun it was uh a little bit simple, but really a good time. A little predictable, too. Yeah, I found I felt that it was the same way. It was definitely a nice gateway game. It's colorful. It's bright. It almost has these kind of, like, I don't know, like, app graphics, I want to kind of explain. Like, almost like old Farmville kind of graphics. Really cutesy. Really nice. Really fun. Like nothing. I'm taking nothing away from the game. I really do enjoy the game. But it was a little predictable. There were some strategies that were better than others. So the fact that this came out with an expansion, and actually there's going to be an additional expansion above and beyond this, is really what this game needs. Now let me talk a little bit about what comes in the expansion. Now first off, beyond the fact that it's going to have a ton of new cards, it actually has a new way to play the game. So instead of laying out all the cards in stacks so that you can pick what you want and everything's available for you, You're going to be mixing everything from the base set, everything from the expansion set into one large deck, shuffle it, and then place the cards out in 10 different slots. So you'll have 10 cards available for purchase each round. If another card comes up that's a duplicate, it'll go on top, and you'll keep drawing until all of those 10 slots are filled. Now, beyond the additional cards that are all kind of thematically related to the harbor, there's some additional buildings here. So, for example... There is a city hall building. It's already active. And basically what it's going to be able to do is when you immediately start the building phase, if you have no money, you get one coin, which is good because it gives you something to go on and it doesn't give you a blank turn in case your dice just don't work for you. Now, above and beyond that, there's some additional purple cards, some red cards, some blue cards. One card in particular, at least for me, felt a little bit broke, and that would have to be the publisher card. Now, this turned out to be a card in the game that really was pushing people around. Now, with the publisher card, and you have to roll a seven to get it, it's one of these purple cards, you get one coin from each player for each, let's say, let's call it a coffee mug and the toast symbol establishment they have on your turn only. So 
when someone picked this up as part of our gaming group, they were kind of cleaning up each and every turn. Even though other players had a seven card that was taking money away from them, the publisher was always grabbing the money back. Now, obviously, you can work around this a little bit by not taking those cards with those symbols. Since the cards come out randomly, you might find that your back is against the wall and you have to take those cards in order to make anything reasonable and be able to produce any money whatsoever. So let me just run down the new cards. First off, you're going to have a sushi. It's going to work in conjunction with the harbor, which is one of those final major kind of buildings you have to build in order to win. And that's going to cost you only two points. So you can kind of knock that out pretty easy. As I said earlier, the city hall is already going to be built, so you won't have to worry about that. Um, you'll have flower orchards, which will kind of snowball off the flower shop. You'll have the pizza joint, which is taking money from people. I already talked about the publisher card, which is a little bit OP, uh, and that's controversial. Dun, 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 dun. I would not say that. I would not <laughs> say that. They Why? will come for you in the night. They will find you. They will haunt your days and nights. <laughs> There's a hamburger stand, which is going to take money. There's a mackerel boat that's going to give you money. If you have a harbor, you get two coins on anyone's turn. There's the tax office, which is pretty interesting, but a little complicated. There's the food warehouse that's going to benefit off the cup cards, the tuna boat again. So there's a lot of cards that are going to kind of benefit off building the major establishments in this game. Now, in addition to having the harbor, which is a card that you'll have to build, there's also the airport. The airport costs 30, but if you build nothing on your turn, you get 10 coins from the bank, which is pretty huge. If somehow you're able to pull 30 coins together in one round and just build that and you'll be able to pull 10 coins every round, you're kind of set. Now, of course, it's hard to get those 30 coins, but nonetheless, it kind of puts you in a good spot. Now, I would say for me, having played this game both in the base set and with this new expansion, I don't really care for these new buildings thematically. I don't think they add anything interesting to the game. I do like the City Hall in the fact that you'll be able to get one coin for each round. I do like the airport that's going to kind of extend the game a little bit, but I think that might be a little bit of a problem. Machi Koro is meant to be a gateway game that plays rather quickly. With the expansion here and the way in which you place the cards out and the additional buildings that you're going to have to build for Final Victory, the game plays really, really long. And I think that's one of the elements of this game that it really should never come upon. It should never play long. And this game just does play long. So while this expansion does add some new interesting things i'm gonna say it's a it's a play not a buy because i think there's other expansions that are going to be better now that everyone understands that this game does need multiple expansions and one little final note this game comes in an enormous box and all it is is a deck of cards and a couple of tokens i've rallied about this many many times this is not good environmentally It's not good as a gamer because you have no space to put the box, and it's just not fun. You open this beautiful box, and you see a single deck of cards and a couple of tokens, and you just can't help but be disappointed. It's not good, guys. you got to do something different. you got to remember, people are buying these games online mostly. It's not a shelf space issue. It's about the gamer getting this game to the hands, getting this game on their personal shelves, and they just can't fit a big box, and they can't be disappointed when they open this up. So for Machi Karo, the Harbor expansion, it's a play, but it's just a play at that because it's just lengthens the game way too long. That's interesting. So it sounds like they made a conscious effort to fix a lot of the things that bothered me about the first time I played it, right? It's very simple, very predictable. So randomizing the stacks helps with that. It also helps eliminate the sort of eliminate all the resources strategy where you can just deprive the person who's after you in the turn order, right? Uh, Which makes that less effective, and I think that makes the game more interesting. There's an element of a risk there, an element of gambling going on. But if it makes the game play too long, then it might just be losing the spirit of the game, and maybe it wasn't worth the fix, right? Maybe the fix did more damage than the than the, uh, the problem did in the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I like the additional landmark cards that are added to this game. So having the harbor, having the airport is a lot of fun. Um, Having City Hall be able to give you money is a lot of fun. But it just plays way too long. And also it adds a opportunity to have a fifth player. So while I always like to have additional players play games, games really do have a sweet spot. And I got to say, it's probably at four players. 
five players, there's some downtime in this game, and it's just a lot of money that's moving around the table, and it really doesn't need to. So that's Machi Koro, the Harbor expansion. If you really need it, you could pick it up, but honestly, I think there are better expansions on the way, and this is probably not the best of them. With that said, now on to our Acquisition Disorders. And now, our Acquisition Disorders. Acquisition Disorders? That's crazy! Only needs the base game, nothing else but the base game. The base game and the expansion, see? Nothing else. Just the base game and the expansion and the promos. The base game and the expansion and the promos and, of course, the upgraded components. Why wouldn't you have the upgraded components? So the base game, the expansion, the promos, and the upgraded components. See? That's not too much, but maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe you might need the explosion. How about you, Daniel? Anything on your Acquisition Disorders for this week? Yeah, though, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit torn about how I should go about acquiring it. So the, the game I'm really interested in right now, is it's on Kickstarter right now, it's called Burgle Brothers. And I'm really interested in buying this game, but I feel like if I'm to be honest to the spirit of the game, I should break into their corporate headquarters and steal it. <laughs> so Burgle Brothers is a cooperative game where you plan and execute a heist in a sort of high-rise building. Uh and it's got a lot of interesting mechanics. It's a pretty simple little cooperative game, so it's something of an entry game, right? A gateway game. And I think co-op games are just about the ideal gateway games because they're the only games where, oh, you've played this game before? Isn't reason to be afraid, right? It's not, oh, God, you're, you're going to just whoop me. It's, oh, you're on my team because you've played this game a 100 times. This is going to be good for me. Not, oh, you've played this game a thousand times, you're going to murder me. There will be nothing left but a fine paste where I once stood. So having, you know, another fun and charismatic entry-level cooperative game is always nice to me. Uh, they've been funding really well, so they've got a couple of exciting stretch uh, goals finished. Uh, the next one, and it looks like they've already hit it, actually, they just haven't acknowledged that they've hit it, is nine custom character meeples which is nice because right now they have the very generic meeples, and that's just not all that attractive. But it looks like a great game. They've got some interesting add-ons. If you liked Paperback and missed a chance to buy it, this is an add-on for this game. Uh, likewise, they have this thing called the High Rise, which is a wood-printed three-level thing to help you capture the feeling of actually, you know, hitting up the High Rise, hitting up the tower. I don't know that I would find that necessary for my gameplay, but if you were really into this game, that would be pretty fun. Another thing to note is that as this game was inspired by a computer game called Monaco, which I remember watching my friends play together because it was sort of our uh, game of the month for a while there, uh, you can actually buy it packaged with a copy, a copy of Monaco for $5 more than the base funding level of $29. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be a game I am almost certainly going to back. Uh, it's pretty exciting, pretty simple, and, you know, right up my alley because I've got the uh, that co-op fixation, you know? <laughs> yeah, and I like the fact that you could add on Paperback, which is a game that's currently out of print or at least out of the stores mostly. So being able to pick that up for 25 bucks is really nice. It's a outstanding little game. But uh, I'm interested to see about how you do pick this up, Daniel, and if you do use some of your thieving ways – in a controversial way to pick this game up. I think you're hitting that note a little hard, man. <laughs> I think you're hitting that note a little hard. If you're going to run with a gag, you might as well drive it into the ground. All right, so that's everything for our Acquisition Disorders. Hear ye, hear ye. The Board Gamers Anonymous Court is now in session. All judgments made by the Board Gamers Anonymous Court are binding. Your get out of free jail card is not valid here. So our feature this week is our BGA court. We're going to take a topic to task. This week's topic is controversial in a lot of ways, or at least is a controversy to certain groups of people. Now, controversy in tabletop gaming is something that maybe you've come across or you've faced personally because of how a character in a game is representing a certain culture, a certain gender, a certain lifestyle. Maybe there's some sort of controversy around who can play a game, who can attend a gaming convention. Or maybe it's an RPG that's outlining certain character traits of a certain class of or group of people that, you know what, may be very stereotypical and just really offensive in a lot of ways. So there's a lot of things to talk about 
when it comes to controversy in tabletop gaming. And what we want to do in a very short way is kind of highlight some of these issues and have a kind of a frank, open discussion about where we stand, bring it out to the open, and hopefully talk about what our responsibility is as gamers, as consumers, and as advocates for the hobby when it comes to tabletop gaming because we are the representatives and we do want to bring more and more people to the table. Now, with that little intro, with that being said, let's talk about something that recently happened, Daniel, and that has to be America's largest gaming convention, Gen Con, threatened to leave Indiana over the anti-gay bill. Did you read about this? Uh, Yeah, I did read about it. It was a a very interesting moment, and I was pretty proud to be a gamer right then i gotta say yeah if you're not familiar with this issue indiana signed a controversial religious freedom bill into law now what the law the senate bill 101 would prohibit was state and local governments from substantially burdening someone's religious belief by let's say in the bill at least forcing them or you know enforcing a situation in which they would have to accommodate people of let's let's say a gay lesbian bisexual transgender or questioning sexual orientation in a just normal way so this bill was kind of brought up and gen con pushed back a little bit and and from gen con statement and i'm going to read this out to you gen con proudly welcomes a diverse attendee base made up of different ethnicities cultures beliefs sexual orientations gender identities abilities, social economic backgrounds. Now, Adrian Swartout, the owner and CEO of Gen Con, wrote this letter to Pence, and it was a way in which hopefully she was kind of planting her flag here and saying, you know what, as a gamer, we invite everyone to the table. And by having laws on the books that says that certain people should not be serviced by organizations and local businesses and, you know, It takes away from who we are as a group and as a society and as a humanity. So she wanted to let government know that business was not happy with this. Now, more than 56,000 people attended Gen Con last year. It's a large, super large gaming convention that happens at the Indiana Convention Center. And more than $50 million is spent in the city annually. So You know, Gen Con has a big stick to kind of, you know, wave around a little bit and say, you know, if we're not happy with this situation, we're going to leave. Now, that being said, the final approval for the bill went ahead and it's going to get the signature and it's going to become part of law. For that, it's a little bit sad that laws that restrict people's opportunity to sit down and play a game or to interact with businesses is quite difficult. And no matter what your religion may be. And personally, as a Roman Catholic, um, somebody of that religious faith, I want everyone to join me at the table. And no matter who they are, they should have a space at the table. I mean, each and every week we talk about this and we say we'll always save you a seat at the table. And we always will. It doesn't matter what your background, what your diversity is. We welcome that. What makes gaming outstanding is by having all of these different people at the table. What do you think, Daniel? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it's an unfortunate move made by Indiana there. Uh, it's disappointing. Uh, I'm very tempted to say in this day and age, but <laughs> I'll uh, I'll try to fight that urge of the sort of progressionist ideology there. But it's just it's thinly veiled discrimination and seems to me to be contrary to certain rules about how interstate commerce must be conducted. But we'll let legal scholars do that because I have no idea what I'm talking about, which doesn't stop <laughs> me from talking about it, you've noticed. Uh, anyway, uh, but I was nonetheless very proud to see that uh, the gaming industry took a stand. And one thing that's you know made me proud there is it's the gaming industry now knows it's got the weight to throw around and it's choosing to throw it around correctly. Or so it seems to me. Now, we've actually had some interesting allies in this cause, too, right? Walmart made a similar statement relating to a similar bill in Arkansas, um, which surprised everybody. It's good to see us moving in the proper direction, and it's good to see that the gaming industry is aware of the role it can play in larger social issues, if for no other reason than it's just a large industry. But you also have to wonder, 
what can gaming do within itself? You know, it's really easy to be like, well, you guys are doing it wrong, so we're going to stop giving you dollars. But what about self-policing? What should we be doing there? And I think there's a more significant question for us. There are, you know, in, in the past, a large number of pretty controversial games, and one of them is uh, Five Tribes. And Five Tribes, Tribes from Days of Wonder... Uh, was really well-loved, except for the fact that it included slaves as part of the game. Now, those of you who've played pretty much any worker placement game, right, or numerous games of this kind, will know that slavery in games is not uncommon. And this was made especially grisly in the fact that you could, things like, discard your slaves to get additional goods and that sort of thing, which sounded kind of like human sacrifice or something. Five Tribes, or Days of Wonder, rather, has responded to this issue and has created a replacement for those cards. Yeah, so the slave cards are now being replaced by cards that feature a fakir. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, including me, just sort of a, a mystic ascetic in either Islam or Hinduism, or depending on how one uses the word, it can be more flexible or less flexible than how much of a stickler you are. But what really makes this interesting in light of this conversation is not so much, hey, we've got a new card and we took out an old piece, uh, or even, hey, we've got this new card that can replace that piece you aren't happy with, uh, but the fact that Days of Wonder really does seem to be paying attention to the social responsibility they have as a form of media producer, right? Games are a medium uh, through which a lot of information is communicated about social expectations and about what kinds of things are acceptable. It's nice to see some sort of self-policing there. Uh, what do you think, Chris? Well, I remember when this game first came out, I was really excited about that. I love Days of Wonders game. This is a Bruno Cathalo game, so I was already into this game. I didn't know much about it, and our friend Dave was nice enough to bring this to the table. I got a chance to play it, and we sat down with the players at the table, and if you don't know about Five Tribes, it's bright, it's colorful, it's a Days of Wonder game. It's about genies. It has genies, Daniel. There's genies in this game. So it's a very kind of non-realistic kind of, you know, Arabian Nights type of world. And as you're looking through the cards, and as Dave was explaining the game, he's like, you can purchase these materials. And it turns out one of the things that you can purchase is slaves. And not in a cute and fun kind of colorful joking kind of way, but in a quote-unquote brown person kind of sad and despondent chained up both hands and feet you know looking at the ground as you know unfortunately as slaves were often depicted as you know the the treatment the poor treatment of them and to be able to purchase a brown person as part of a game as part of a euro kind of fun cutesy game was kind of unsettling to be honest with you and when I, as I was playing the game, you know, we already had started, uh, I, I didn't buy any of those cards because I was like, this is very strange and very weird. And I don't I wasn't really sure how I felt about this. We had another player at the table who was also a person of, I would guess, similar skin tone. Uh, myself, I'm also a person of Puerto Rican descent amongst, you know, my Italian descent and you know, it just really touched home a little bit. And it was just like, I felt bad playing, especially playing this game with somebody who was, you know, had to interact with cards that had roles that were reinforcing, you know, a negative aspect of our society as a fun, interesting, you know, game night. Now, it's not to wash away the historical fact or even the current fact that there are slaves. I mean, if you know, for no other reason, the fact that there are still slaves and slavery throughout the world, I want to bring light to that. So, yeah, I want to play Freedom the Underground Railroad, and I want to I want to have the activity of, you know, setting free slaves. But do I want to be purchasing slaves, especially in a Days of Wonder game, especially in a game full of color and fun? No, I, I really don't. It was it was really disappointing. I made this mention on I made mention of this on the Dice Tower's year-end review as my most disappointing moment in gaming. And as a big fan of Days of Wonder, I was really just kind of taken back by this. So, you know, originally they were like, you know, we didn't mean to offend anybody, and it's historic, which still seems weird. And now I guess they got enough feedback from consumers, from socially-minded gamers, 
that they felt the need to have these replacement cards. And in the future editions, you won't have the slave cards there. Now, once again, will this change the world? No. Will this kind of, you know, make race relations right? Will this free slaves? No. But honestly, at some point, maybe even in small ways, maybe in in almost insignificant ways, we got to do something. We got to say that we're not comfortable with things. We're consumers. We're part of the industry. We're big fans. We don't want to see these games cast aside and thrown out. You know, I'm a big fan of Bruno Cathala, and I want to play his game. Having these new cards in future editions, it might actually make me pick up this game, which before I was not only not going to pick up, but I was not going to play again in the future. Yeah. So bravo to Days of Wonder, bravo to Bruno Cathala, and whoever else was involved in this decision-making process. And to all the fans out there and the people on Board Game Geek who took grief because they have a sensitivity to other people or maybe just a, just a general sensitivity, which is a wonderful thing to have. You just now invited more people to the table. You brought our gaming industry up to the next level, and it's only going to get better from here. You know, small changes like this means on a very small way, but in a very important way, that we're not, you know, we're not happy with these things. And hopefully, you know, there'll be small little ripples that kind of cast out and make some changes somewhere else in the world. Well, we should make, uh, you know, be careful not to override or totally ignore that there is a legitimate counter argument here, which is... The theme they chose for the game is a theme that includes slavery, right? They are replicating uh, Arabian Nights. The story involves slaves. Uh, And so I do think it's important not to give the impression that people who wanted to stick closer to the story, to the text, are somehow insensitive, right? They may just be more of these sort of uh, source material loyalists, right? Um, And it is a difficult thing to balance when you do that sort of thing, right? And it yields the question of maybe there are some sources that we shouldn't be drawing from. Because I do think that gaming as a medium has some properties that are not shared by, say, television or just general storytelling. uh, Because it makes you an actor. It makes you an agent implementing certain decisions. I think a great example of how this can affect us, right, is that game Trains, which was really more of an art piece, uh, where you putting meeples onto a train as efficiently as possible, and you're moving them along, and then you're allowed to turn over the card. You see that, oh, look, you're bringing them to Auschwitz, um, right? You're bringing them to be killed at a death camp, and this was, you know, you were helping the Nazis, uh, and this idea of complicity, uh, right? And there's this, what, what makes that so powerful is that more than, say, watching a documentary about the Holocaust, is that by playing a game, you take on a role and exhibit agency in that role. That is, you take a certain amount of responsibility for organizing your actions, right? And so you get invested in that way. Uh, And so Trains uses that, of course, to deliver a powerful social message about complicity. Uh, But it can backfire on us too, right? That same sort of agentic involvement if there are parts of the games that necessarily involve you becoming an agent perpetuating systems of inequality or oppression, uh, then there might be something bad about that game, independent of its qualities as a game, right? independent of its amusement value. There might be something unhealthy about that game, unhealthy about having you taking on these roles. We've seen this sort of discussion in other sorts of gaming, We've seen this discussion for decades in video games, right, about whether or not violence in video games is damaging. Uh, And there's, you know, mixed debate and mixed research on that, and it's still not really clear. Uh, But uh, it's about time we become more conscious of that in board gaming and role-playing games as well. Yeah, and I think that's really the issue here. It's not that we're saying that anyone involved, whether it's designers, publishers, or gamers, really is... A negative agent here. It's just that there are certain things that we can do better. There are certain things that allow more people to feel comfortable at the table. And if the game is, you know, like as you said earlier, Daniel, about like historical accuracy. Now, if you're playing a game like Freedom of the Underground Railroad and you want to have that situation where there is you know, slave catchers, uh, you know, capturing slaves as part of the mechanic. Now you're trying to to free them, but nonetheless, if you want to have that mechanic in a game, 
That's historical accuracy. Five tribes is more along the lines of adherence to a certain mythology. And, you know, like all mythologies, as time goes on, there are certain things that we don't include. So, you know, you could have more nudity in a game or you could have women in these games as sexual slaves or prostitutes or other things of that nature because it would be fitting the time and age. But we don't do that because our sensitivities, we've evolved, we've grown, we've developed, and it's just not something we want to engage in. And this is where I think that idea of agentic involvement, and this is, I'm using this phrase a lot because I've got a research program involving this on the side, but this idea that games elicit us to act as agents and become sort of compli- not just complicit, but active in creating certain systems uh, becomes a useful tool because the question is not what is the content of your game, right? Not what is the theme, does it include slaves, but in what manner does the player interact with them? And I think in this case, it's one that's probably harmful. Uh, I mean, it's certainly not helpful. Whereas in Freedom, all the other problems I have with that game aside, right, the way one interacts with this is the way that we would find at least to be pro-social in the modern world, right? It's the right way to have acted at that point in time. Uh, And even though the history of the world is such that there have been horrible, brutal things, we should not be having you and having ourselves become accustomed to perpetuating those uh, through gameplay. Games are training, in a sense, for how we think about the world. That's why they're everywhere, right? That's why chess is an IQ test in medieval Europe. Right? That's why sports are very similar to hunting activities and war activities, right? Games train us to think and act in certain ways, and if we let them train us poorly, uh, that's going to be a problem. Sure. Now... You know, this game and many other games like Lap Dance that was on Kickstarter recently that I talked about during Kicking the Habit and a number of other games. Lap Dance is a game about a strip club where you have these female strippers stripping as part of the game, but you also have male strippers. So, you know, when you look at the game, you're like, "Ah, that just doesn't feel right. Why are these, you know, having a game with women strippers? But it's okay because the men are there. And I think the difference is that what people were asking about, and even with the slaves here, it's different because traditionally and historically and even today, these populations, these groups of people, whether it be women or minorities, people of color, are often repressed. So it's different when a white male, you know, if you had a, a picture of a white male as a slave, it's still, still not something to be happy about, but at least like you feel, eh. Or if you're watching, you know, if you're looking at lap dance and you have this, you know, big bulky white guy kind of stripping, you're like, all right, you know, I guess that's a thing. But when you have a woman do it or you have a person who has dark skin as a slave, it's not a choice. It's it's not a fun thing. It's not something that you're engaging with because, oh, that was just a kind of different, interesting choice. This is what's going on. These people have less empowerment in our society. I mean, that's just a truth. And to play a game that continuously puts these people in these types of roles to denigrate them, even though it's not, you know, major in in any particular game. But it it, for me, it feels weird. I, I don't know, Daniel. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the what you're getting at there is that there's a very big difference between uh, suffering as an individual that is being victimized and suffering as part of a group that is being oppressed, right? Uh, and being a victim, right, that can happen to anyone, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, right? You can uh, suffer under the lash. You can be murdered, killed. Let's hope none of this happens to any of our listeners or anyone, ideally, but of course that's not a realistic wish. Uh, but you know, anyone can be victimized, and victimization is almost an historical, right? It doesn't really involve these large social structures in the same way that oppression does, right? Oppression is a product of prolonged histories and entrenched social attitudes and structures that perpetuate themselves. And they perpetuate themselves partially through the presentation of oppressed groups in media, like gaming. Uh, and I think, again, not to hit the hammer you know, hit my gavel too many times. I think that there is something significant about the way that gaming gets you involved that makes it more effective at inculcating these sort of attitudes, Um, you know, getting us to think how the game wants us to think. 
which might make it especially dangerous or especially helpful. And I think they're, you're right, that there's a difference between, oh, yeah, we got male strippers there. If there were not a system, a historical system of oppression, right, uh, uh, that perpetuated the idea of women's, uh, women as uh, sexual objects and nothing more, then that would be fine. There would be no uncomfortable sensation there. It would just be okay. But the thing is that this is part of an ongoing rhetoric, an ongoing system of oppression that perpetuates the idea of women as sexual objects. And by inculcating that attitude, even in a fictional and playful way, uh, we contribute to those systems of oppression and perpetuate them into the future. Uh, and so, yeah, there's there's going to be a huge difference there. I mean, ideally, we might look at our themes more broadly, right? We are talking about slavery and, and sexual objectification. We might also one day say this whole, all this war game stuff is really, ugh, you know, kind of nasty. But at the very least, the uh, the war games typically don't involve this same sort of contribution to negative social momentum. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's the one difference here because I know a lot of people are trying to kind of rack their brain with this. Like they know something feels unright, but they since we do play so many different types of war games or activities where civilizations are battling each other. But I think when you play those games, it's abstracted. It's also that usually both forces are equal when they're battling each other. So whether it's a fantasy force or some sort of alien race or something like that. Um, it's usually, I got five guys, you got five guys. They just happen to be fighting each other, and it doesn't really hit a nerve like it does with these social disparities that we're currently facing. And I think it's okay to kind of question these things. If these, if there's a game that you're not comfortable with because of one of the roles or the activities you might take in a game, don't play it. There's no reason for you to play that game. There's a tremendous amount of great games out there Find the game that's right for you. If you're okay with these games, just keep in mind that maybe it's okay for you, but maybe you're in a privileged position. And I think that's something that we often have to look at, that most of the gamers out there are white males between, let's say, between 20 and 40 and live in America or Germany or somewhere in a, you know, somewhere in a country in Europe. And we are privileged to live where we do live, to be able to spend this type of income on a hobby and maybe we're missing out on certain things. And, you know, you don't have to go far to look at, you know, all of the depictions of women's and fantasy games and things like that. And I want women to play my games. I want people of different cultures, different customs, different backgrounds, different orientations. I want them to sit and play the games. I want players. And in the end, while all of these aspects are very important to society as a gamer, don't we all want more people to play? Don't, want, don't we want to have a full table? Do we want to struggle with getting players to the table? We don't want that. We want to have as many people as possible. We want to play different roles. We want to try out these different things. And by having games that are correct socially, and now it doesn't, you, doesn't mean you can't have fun with the roles and joke around with it and have different artistic and thematic you know, presentations, but it should come along with a certain sensitivity that while it may not bother you, it may bother other people and it may have a small slight effect on society in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple of issues that are also worth mentioning at this point. So one is which is it's important to note not just games that are problematic due to what they have in them. There are a lot of games that are problematic due to what they don't have. Note, women, people of color, people of other ethnic groups, other religions, what have you, right? Uh, and there are a few games here that are really good guys, and by listing them, you'll start to see who the bad guys might be. Uh, Flashpoint is a good guy, right? It is a game about firemen, but they were, you know, true to form. They thought about it and they made it a game about fire rescue personnel, right? It's not just about men. There are women on those cards, and there are actually people of other ethnicities represented, though not as widely as one might have hoped. Uh, same with Pandemic, right? There are women in the game, and they are not dolled up, scantily clad, chainmail bikini wearing, you know, quote-unquote female representatives. 
uh, they're actual women, right? They're scientists. They're leaders in their field. Uh, and I think perhaps the uh, biggest uh, pro side for me recently is also one of the uh, historical offenders of the greatest category, which is Dungeons & Dragons, which in its most recent version has gone so far as to make clear that not all cultures conform to heterosexual concepts of sexual orientation, right, or heterosexual uh, normativity. Uh, they don't all have two gendered concepts. There are androgynous entities, right, and that is something that the cultures deal with. Uh, and by opening those gameplay options up, you not only fill out the world in a much more realistic way, because those are historical things that have been part of these worlds forever, uh, but you invite people to take roles at the table which instill a sort of positive social momentum as opposed to a negative one. Because next time you sit down to a game where you're taking a role, look at the cards. Look to see how many of them are anybody but a white male. You will find a disparity. It is not intentional, almost certainly, right? It's no one sitting down at the council board saying, yes, let us recapitulate the systems of white privilege, yes. And that's part of what makes the structures of privilege so insidious, is that they happen by accident, in a sense, right? It's just what we're used to, so it's what we do. But if you become aware of it, if you become cognizant of it, and you just take a moment to reflect and see what systems of privilege might be reflected in the games you're playing, uh, you'll find a much greater appreciation for the importance of sort of social representation or pro-social representation in gaming, I think. And you get more gamers to the table, which is also awesome. Always awesome. <laughs> well, for the BJ Court, I think that we took care of that matter once and for all. No matter how controversial may be. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just some thoughts from the BJ Court about these controversial issues, controversy in gaming, and something about our social responsibility as players, as consumers, and as members of the industry. Let people know, let publishers, let designers, let fellow gamers know when there are things that don't feel right for you because in the end... We are one big family, and people want you to enjoy your gaming experience, want you to join us at the table, want to sell you games that you would really like. It's not a negative thing. It's not a harsh criticism. It's just a critique, like everything that goes on in the industry that we're a part of, just to make games better. So just like we build variants and we build special house rules, let people know what would bring more people to your table and make them feel more comfortable and enjoy the experience and expand the tabletop gaming family. All right, so that's everything for this week. This is Chris. And this is Daniel. And until next week, no matter how controversial it may be, we still want you to join us at the table. <laughs> <laughs>